uh, good good evening everyone uh, this is uh, a to 30 B and this is our third class right if I'm not mistaken uh, this is our third right um, and I'm sharing the screen I would like you to confirm that you can see the screen okay good nice so how many are we we are uh, 33 people which is good okay so what do you have to say about the class experience so far now that we have met uh, twice already so let's talk about so what is it that you're getting out with now that we have taken two classes so let's talk about uh, I'll give you perhaps a minute or two to give me some uh, classroom ex uh, I mean you know uh, impressions whether you're finding the material nice and interesting or otherwise uh, like uh, we always do uh, the mic is enabled all you need to do is to kind of raise your hand so that I can allow you we tried it the other day and it was very successful remember there was I think uh, Sara and also Kamar they tried and they were very uh, successful right okay so um, I rem okay okay so uh, Arsh is saying that she or everybody else for that matter studied the idea of home and abroad and uh, the reviews of the book that's uh, pretty uh, that's that's great I mean give, you know uh, okay uh, is it an indication that you guys are excited and you feel at home with the material or is it that you're perhaps sensing uh, uh, the the pressure that you uh, that you are under given the fact that the time is sh you know limited and stuff okay so Fahd is saying the class is interactive and Kamar is saying so far so good and Arsh Arsh I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm pronouncing the name correctly is saying that uh, it's definitely interesting uh, of course she's talking about the material not the class uh, Sarah is saying yeah actually we are under pressure yet it is very interesting it's a very interesting course nice okay good Bye. so I'm not going to say anything today I leave all the talking to you how about that <laughs> just kidding so um, uh, I I couldn't you know, find it in my heart to um, to go to uh, chapter six and we have remnants in chapter five. Uh, so we're finishing off chapter five today, and um, next time we'll mark the end of all this weathering heights business. Uh, okay so uh, chapter 5 now that you have done chapter 5 you guys all uh, read chapter 5 as far as I can uh, um, you know gather from what you're saying um, Al Ustaz also read the novel that that's I mean um, amazing uh, you know, somebody was complaining that the novel is big and everything for now that other people are finding it uh, less challenging this is good news we need to communicate this positiveness uh, to other people uh, perhaps they they get intimidated by um, you know uh, the shape of the novel and you no know, we need to reassure them and say it's just uh, another novel and uh, what counts at the end would be uh, um, how interesting the novel is and I think it is uh, it's it's an interesting novel in a morbid way <laughs> in in a gloomy uh, and grim kind of way um, most of us are, <laughs> are not used to this kinds of novels 
because we normally uh, especially in our formative years uh, we are used to uh, I mean in our formative years of course um, mentally uh, we tend to read light-hearted novels I mean you would be reading a mystery or a thriller, uh, a th <laughs> a thriller I'm sorry a thriller uh, or even a romance right so to have such a challenging text that is written in, in, in a language also that is a little bit uh, strange in, in terms of the style of the writer and also in terms of the fact that it was written a um, hundred uh, perhaps more than a hundred uh, years um, ago which which places challenges on on the choice of words and all these kinds of things Uh, Layla is saying uh, it's I think her first novel and she finds it easy and I am happy about it okay so give me headlines what are the headlines contained in chapter 5 let me just remind you of the title of chapter 5 so it's Emily Pronte weathering heights at home okay at home and there is obviously more to the word at home or to the phrase at home than uh, uh, meets the eye. There is obviously more. I mean, the, uh, the concept is, uh, you know, pregnant with ideas, if you like. Okay. So let's talk about what it means. I mean, let's unpack the concept one more time and then proceed to... Uh, the chapter and then leave the chapter behind and go somewhere else okay so again I am inviting you to come to the mic and participate you guys um, you know wh whenever you take up the mic you say very nice stuff okay I like it when when I hear you uh, speak if I don't deny me this uh, <laughs> this uh, this feeling I feel happy and uh, entertained when people come to the mic because you guys are very deep. You um, you are even deeper than we give you credit for. Make no mistake about it. So I'm so proud of you and I'd like to listen to what you have to say. Uh, again, the chapter is Emily Pronti, Weathering Heights at Home. So let's talk about the concept of home and how uh, you understood you assimilated it what what does it mean to you now I mean let's talk about the associations of at home as as far as the course is concerned uh, if somebody can come to the mic uh, okay it says the novel is exciting but it is long it says the, the love story between the gypsy Heathcliff and high rank uh, Catherine and he doesn't I mean the sentence is not complete obviously or perhaps is giving us one of the ideas uh, in the novel so uh, so any any luck with this idea of coming to the mic and saying something okay uh, I don't want to exercise any pressure on you if you're happy this way it's okay no problem okay so w what is it that uh, uh, we had this in this uh, chapter Wh what were some of the aims of the chapter if you study me let me just remind you of the aims these are the aims right still remember them <clears throat> so we're um, yeah Sarah El Hariri wants to uh, talk let's let's have her talk yes okay go ahead Sarah hello Sarah if you can hear us and you want to say something go ahead the mic is yours. Yeah, can you hear me? 
Ah, yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, hello. Um, actually, as, as you said, doctor, it's, uh, the concept is about the home. And at that time, home is meant to be um, uh, a secure and safe place, uh, cozy, and um, you know, anything, everything related to, um, to be safe and secure. Um, as as em the writer, the author, Emily Bronte, uh, contradicts this uh, concept, and uh, this what um, uh, this what uh, um, make the the novel um, uh, not accepted for like at that time it wasn't accepted for this um, uh, this concept uh, that Bronte uh, 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 like uh, uh, present in the novel. Yeah. So well, this well, is basically. Yeah, oh. why? Why do you think she's challenging the concept of home with its uh, obvious associations, like you said, uh, coziness, comfort, uh, um, you know, security and safety? Wh why? Why do you think she is challenging that? Uh, because I, I think, yeah, no, no one, um, no one uh, presents this or show or shows this uh, before. Uh, like she write it um, in the Victorian era, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and it was a preservative uh, society. Um, even even she as a writer, uh, as a female writer, uh, th there were no um, uh, female writers at that time, like as much as the males. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps she has a different view. She doesn't believe, I mean, uh, perhaps female as she is. You, you know, uh, women have always been under uh, extreme pressure from the, the male-dominated uh, society. Perhaps for her, um, I mean, family and home do not mean what it means to, uh, what they mean to everybody else. Uh, perhaps she wasn't secure. She she didn't feel those kinds of uh, um, ideas that uh, everybody was promoting in the Victorian age. Uh, okay, so, uh, perhaps she, she she she's trying to say that life is more complex than that. There is more to yeah. life than just uh, safety and security and having. Uh, um, a lady or a woman who is cleaning up all the time, who is making sure that everybody is happy, because yeah, and uh, we have uh, the opposite side, the opposite mm. uh, uh, viewpoint also. Mm. Like uh, it's like it's we have the good and we have uh, the bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Uh, anybody else? Uh, anybody else would would like to elaborate on the idea of home? Um, has perhaps a different viewpoint. Uh, Nof is saying. Uh, uh, Nof is saying. I think she's trying to reflect how there is more than what uh, meets the eye. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. Uh, remember, we said that she came. She came to her own in terms of appreciation much later. At the time, she was attacked because of the fact that people thought that she is uh, also challenging the the uh, established uh, sensibilities of the time if you like uh, society is secure so society has uh, a set of conventions and everybody is going by them for for uh, a lady writer to come over and challenge that uh, this was obviously not uh, very well received by lots of people Remember, she was writing under a pseudonym, and pseudonyms are, you know, uh, pen names that people uh, uh, take up in order to avoid uh, being, uh, you know, attacked by, uh, by 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 other people. Sometimes, uh, when you write in your own name, it's easy uh, for other people to attack. So some people take up this idea of pseudonym. And she she uh, she had uh, a name uh, that would not uh, indicate whether she is male or female. Uh, Laila is saying, "I'm sorry, but net now isn't clearly to me. But I try to have okay." Laila, you can always go out and come back. 
if you are experiencing challenges with the net uh al is saying the individual searches safe home and secure families to look after him okay 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 Tai. nice so again we're exploring the idea of home in the text and the text uh, here of course is weathering heights um okay towards the end of the chapter we will uh, switch gears and talk about the idea of abroad but um, um, the in-depth analysis of abroad would be uh, or will be in the following chapter the uh, entire chapter uh, chapter uh, <coughs> 6 is going to be exclusively about the idea of abroad um, again we we've been talking about the history of uh, the reception of this novel this novel has a history uh, uh, when it comes to how it was received down through the ages we're focusing on the early uh, days when uh, it was first published how uh, people received uh, received it and whether uh, this reception was favorable or otherwise uh, so uh, I'm, I'm getting distracted by uh, ideas other than the ideas that we're discussing if we're discussing something don't take me away to other issues because I cannot help but look at uh, the chat area and, and some people get me distracted by talking about uh, issues that we're not discussing please focus and keep to what we're talking about in the interest uh, of class time and in, in the interest of clarity uh, and everything um, again we're talking about how the novel was received uh, especially in its early uh, days and why we're focusing on the early days uh, or the reception in the early days because uh, we're uh, we're kind of trying to uh, gauge the reaction of people at the time uh, uh, especially uh, when it comes to the idea of whom and the idea of abroad okay so we're moving within those parameters but that's why we're we're measuring the reception we're seeing or checking how uh, the novel was received so uh, we spoke enough about how the novel was received for the most part the reception was negative but of course there were uh, um, some favorable reviews uh, pointing to the fact that the the writer is original in her ideas uh, that she uh, she has this sense of drama to her work and she uh, she 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 is a promising uh, drama if she t decides to take up uh, drama uh, one of the critics is saying that she can be uh, uh, a good uh, dramatist um, right you still remember that um, a part of the um, what we're talking about uh, in the chapter also is the idea of realism and uh, romance and we're talking about them as techniques rather than as themes and these are not themes when, when I talk about realism I talk about um, uh, the novel um, as, a, as as part of the uh, realistic tradition or the, or, or the, the yeah realistic uh, tradition and when I say tradition tradi I mean realism it has a number of features uh, um, and a number of associations that we're going to share together so also romance there is uh, again more to romance than uh, the usual love uh, uh, concept that people that two people loving each other no romance is uh, um, again is um, has uh, characteristics um, it's it's a kind of 
uh, genre in and of itself um, and then we go back to the idea of the reader because this this is one of the ideas that uh, will stay with us for for quite some time okay so this this chapter is basically about the idea of who um, the next chapter is going to be about the generic composition of the novel uh, with reference to the idea of abroad Uh, again the reception uh, remember some of the adjectives uh, they would describe the novel uh, with I mean the negative adjectives what did they say about the novel at one point they said gloomy coarse right the pain is unjustifiably big and enormous right weird strange okay so the idea of strangeness moves beyond the setting and beyond the uh, um, strangeness is not only about the character of Heathcliff obviously all the characters are strange in their own ways, right? The surroundings are strange. The atmosphere is strange and stormy, right? Even the techniques employed in the novel correspond uh, to these uh, uh, elements of strangeness. When you have more than one uh, narrator, right yes and this is how the novel is described this is one of the early uh, reviews in in a newspaper uh, by the name of the spectator I, I don't know whether it's a newspaper or a magazine uh, the reviewer is saying that the incidents are too coarse and we spoke about this idea of coarseness coarseness mean, means harsh unbearable and disagreeable disagreeable it means that uh, uh, those incidents can attack your sensibilities can challenge uh, 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 your sensibilities in other words And they are improbable. Improbable, it means, wh what do I mean by improbable? Improbable here means that they are not likely to happen. Yes, it is true. We said that she's, she's saying something different. So, of course, it, they are not true. They are not uh, probable within the context of the Victorian age. And this is partly the reason why they are against the novel right with a moral taint yes and we spoke about this moral taint the fact that uh, you know again there are lots of stuff that Victorian readers would consider um, not morally correct or upright again this has to do with Heathcliff and how be he behaves and how he deals with the other characters and how the other characters behave right uh, again if you talk about the idea of morality and respectability you wouldn't uh, expect uh, Catherine to uh, to be uh, married to somebody 
and then at the self same time nursing love and passion for another this is also attacking the sensibilities or the established sensibilities of the Victorian uh, readers they wouldn't accept that okay so there is a moral thing something is not morally correct about the novel as far as this reviewer is concerned okay there is also a reference to the villainy or the fact that there is a sense of villainy villainy is from villain villain is evil in the novel uh, uh, and these villainy uh, lead lead or leads to results that are not sufficient for the suffering and the pain that we are having in the novel okay so in other words there is needless pain and suffering unnecessary pain and suffering in the novel yeah uh, Fahd is saying it is overly dramatic well put excellent uh, in a sense yes what else do they s did they said D did they say about the novel okay they also said that the novel is too extreme uh, see the novel is too extreme and is marred by detailed and protracted depictions of violence see so there is a great deal of violence in the novel and it is extreme in its portrayal of violence and the other uh, uh, aspects so can you give me examples of violence or extreme violence if you like and the violence itself is extreme so i wouldn't use the word extreme with violence so kamar wants to raise uh, to uh, she's raising her hand to speak let's allow her kamar go ahead um dr san the brother I, I forgot his name he was violent towards his own son and Heathcliff was also violent toward, toward his own son. When he, his son was dying, and Heathcliff didn't, didn't care, didn't really care. And he was like, let him die. Mm. And the, the, the brother, he wanted to drop his, uh, his son off the stairs, but Heathcliff saved him. Like, who would, who would hurt his own child? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kamar. Any other examples of uh, explicit violence that we had in the novel? Yeah, El Ustaz. Yeah, okay, that's that's correct. Okay, uh, people are typing, but that's why I'm. Uh, um, yeah. um, Doctor Sam, there is yes. also uh Heathcliff violence toward his own wife Isabella uh, he uh, like uh, Arch is saying Heathcliff was abusing Isabella yes uh, this is no, domestic yes. violence at its highest right nice okay good so um, and we're talking about family this is happening within the confines of home I remember what home meant to the Victorians yeah, go ahead. Nabila uh, is ready to speak today. Nabila, we are all ears. Nabila, can you hear us? Uh, you ask for the mic. Are you going to use the mic? okay uh, perhaps not now okay okay so lots of examples of violence as you can see and this violence is not justified because it's uh, inflicted on your loved ones right I can understand that you inflict violence on people that you don't know from outside this your family circle 
but to inflict violence and suffering on your own people this is uh, beyond understanding sometimes so to inflict violence within the circle of the family and at home is what the Victorian right uh, I mean readers were were obviously against okay okay uh, there is uh, before I took uh, about the uh, the what uh, people uh, what some critics a few as a matter of fact uh, what uh, a few critics considered positive aspects of the novel before I talk about that uh, I would like to highlight the fact that um, most of the um, the criticism leveled against the novel was focusing um, on the outsides. There is uh, a great deal talk about the house itself, um, its uh, different parts, its interior, right? Uh, comparing the house to a prison okay so it's it's not deep analysis that we're having uh, exploring and delving deep into uh, the reasons why people behaving the way they do uh, you know probing the reasons why Heathcliff would uh, act the way he he does or the way he did right So, in in one of the reviews, we have a critic by the name of Henry Corley, and Corley describes the home at Wuthering Heights as a prison, which might be pictured from life, and he says that let us hope that the author will spare us further interior so gloomy as the one here elaborated with such dismal minuteness and you spoke about this dismal minuteness um, minuteness we understand right from minute details I mean he's saying that there is a great deal of uh, detail he's not saying that uh, those details are unnecessary or, or needless he is saying that they are for the most part uh, uh, you know dismal details uh, they uh, those details are uh, you know exaggerated when it comes to how gloomy they are uh, uh, minute is not trivial minute is small small niceties that you would otherwise ignore okay yes um, and do we have examples of these uh, minute details do we have examples of this minuteness or rather dismal minuteness yes we have that look at um, Lockwood when he first started um, remember Lockwood was uh, one of the narrators and he was talking when when he went there and he started to describe the house at Wuthering Heights he was giving us details right Uh, these are details that I'm sure you came across when you read the novel. Uh, remember this part on page 2 when he said one step brought us into the family sitting room and then 
he started to talk and until he stopped that uh, other dogs uh, haunted other recesses okay so details are there but they are like we said they are dismal in the sense that there is a great deal of gloom about what is happening you're talking about dysfunctional families there is a great deal of family chaos internal chaos people are disrespectful of each other there is a great deal of domestic abuse happening right Uh, you're going to always have this discrepancy or this uh, mismatch between the description sometimes um, of uh, you know objects and stuff and the characters themselves you can have fine description when he described the house the, he said that's uh, just another house in the north of England um, where the owner is um, uh, perhaps um, uh, a middle class individual, a farmer, you know, just the usual. Okay. Uh, but what is not usual normally would be the behavior of the characters when they when he meets them remember and the situations I mean, at one point he was he got bitten by the dogs of heathcliff right very strange and you need to always put this against the idea that lookwood came all the way from the south to enjoy the quote unquote primitiveness and the quote unquote innocence of the north did he get that did he get innocence and uh, primitiveness and rusticness in a nice way he was another romantic individual in the manner of uh, perhaps Word wordsworth and those, those poets who go to places um, untrodden by by people they go to rustic places and they enjoy themselves there they say this is real life it's the life of ordinary people it's the life of the village simple life did we get that do we have simple life do we have good people in 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 weathering heights and the two houses no we're not getting that right which is very strange right Uh, remember even the encounters I mean Lockwood for example we, when he has those encounters with the uh, different characters remember young Catherine and how she treated him when he was offering help uh, this is inappropriate to say the least uh, which is out of keeping with also the manners of country people people who live in the country are normally very decent right they treat people in a nice way they are not vulgar but what we're seeing from young Catherine and the others uh, is obviously vulgarity at its best it's the complete opposite like Sarah is saying right which is also very strange again we don't expect uh, I mean verbal violence we don't expect uh, any of these uh, negative uh, aspects when it comes to whom again we're reading 
uh, all of these things against the idea of home as uh, pleasant, safe, free from uh, verbal abuse, right? F uh, free from domestic violence, uh, home where uh, women play a very major role in uh, bringing about happiness to the different members of the family, uh, bringing about uh, keeping the peace and and keeping the stability of the to, uh, of the place. Most of the female characters that we meet are very aggressive, right? Aren't they aggressive? Can you can you give me examples of aggressiveness? Uh, I mean, female aggression, if you like, in the novel. Yes. Uh, let's focus uh, uh, on the female characters. Uh, I am claiming that they were verbally abusive. Uh, do you agree with me? Do you have examples that support my argument? That most of the female characters were uh, verbally abusive, to say the least. Fahad is saying is, uh, Kathy had anger attacks and hit or uh, shout uh, at people, yes. Uh, Noor is saying that uh, when Catherine rejected Heathcliff, um, or she's saying they are not the mainstream women of Victorian, of the Victorian era, that's correct. Uh, this is where the clash happens between the conventions. We see women in a certain way in, a, in the Victorian age, but w what do we get from Emily Pronte? A totally different image of women, right? Little wonder she is poorly received, like we always say. Um, Noor is saying and love the other comer. Um, oh, can I say so? absolutely? Go ahead. Um, so, Dr. Sameh, um, when Catherine went to the other house, she came back apparently looking in, in, as a woman, as a Victorian woman, but her actions were the opposite in a way. Uh. She she became violent. She mm -hmm. started attacking people, and she became also manipulative. She even started acting the attacking the maid, the Nelly Dean. So she looked like a woman, suppose, where she went home and she got like a makeover and so. But her her actions were the opposite. Yeah, are you implying a comer? And uh, this is a question uh, for everyone. Are you guys implying that the place can have such an influence on the character? Places can change people. You can be innocent and everything, but the impact of the place is overwhelming. It can change you in a negative way. Of course, I believe. Of course. Oh, oh okay. Uh, why? Uh, why is this of courseness? <laughs> if you like. Because when she was in Withering Heights, she was acting with Heathcliff as a friend. She welcomed him. She was playing with him. But when she went to the other house and she came back, she became a different person completely. She even, when she greeted him, she started, like, she went away and she was like, oh, you're so dirty. She never before pointed out about his appearance, about his untidiness or anything. But when she came back, she suddenly opened her eyes and she was like, oh, this, this person is not like us. Uh, you're giving us, uh, yeah, uh, come out with all due respect, you're giving us examples of ver verbal abuse. My question is about whether you think that a place can, has, uh, can have such a huge influence, it can change people. Do you think this is uh, happening? I mean, places, I mean, you can be innocent and you can be uh, morally correct, but if you're put in a certain place, 
you act otherwise okay uh, perhaps this is a philosophical question <laughs> i should keep it to myself no i i do i do i do uh, no i do agree but like i think it depends more about the people around you when she went to the other house it was a family where kind of more noble like the mom herself was uh, more more prestigious and more of a victorian woman she didn't accept heathcliff she was like oh this filthy creature so in a way she was affected by these people around her okay so let's tweak it a little bit it's going to 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 be the place and its people right yes of mm. course the place and its people oh okay interesting nice okay Okay, so the extreme events in the novel were among the features that led critics to describe Wuthering Heights as the setting of a drama. Okay, so this is obviously, when I say drama, you have over, people overreacting. We have, you have a great deal of what, what's your concept of drama here? What are the associations of drama that uh, this this guy is using? I mean, they are saying in, ex in its extremity, the novel can be compared to a drama. What do we mean by that? Um, you, you know the elements of a drama, right? You, in terms of setting, in terms of plot, and even characters. Characters in a drama are not as relaxed the, the, as uh, characters in uh, perhaps a novel, or um, right? Uh, or she's saying too, too many dramatic events taking place, yeah. Uh, okay, so the extreme events in the novel were among the features that led critics to describe Wuthering Heights as the setting of a drama. So we're talking about the element of setting in a drama, where you normally have certain features when it comes to setting. By setting, of course, we mean time and place, right? Okay, so we're describing the house is, is described by one of the critics and the, the, the critic who says that it is more or less like a drama he's saying uh, it's a rude old-fashioned house okay this is Wuthering Heights I mean the place or the house is described as rude and by the way the word rude here means rustic rustic belonging to the rural belonging to the countryside a rude old-fashioned house at the top of one of the high uh, moors or, or fells in the north of England, right? Um, Archie is also um, addressing the idea of tension. She's saying that the tension between and among the characters um, would uh, make the, the novel a drama, yeah, yes. Dramas are about tension, as you may know. Yes, absolutely. About conflict. Okay, characters do not take it easy as they do in novels and other um, uh, genres. But, uh, of course, the drama would not stop with Wuthering Heights. Even the other house is uh, or has its own share of drama. Uh, people there are not innocent, right? People there are as violent, right? Uh, we got the impression at the very beginning from the revelations of Heathcliff and Catherine, when we when they went there, we, they ran there at one point. That um, 
it's a totally different place where people are perhaps more civilized less violent but when the action goes there we see a totally different story where people are as violent where people are as uh, angry right isn't that correct uh, before I leave uh, this part about the uh, the reception of the novel which has been as you have seen uh, which has been negative for the most part I'd like to point to some positive reviews some of the reviews were positive and and I'm saying some and I would say uh, in terms of uh, numbers the the number of negative reviews will uh, um, naturally enough outweigh the number of uh, positive reviews again because we're reading the novel against uh, a number of conventions and, an, and a number of concepts in the Victorian age um, so what did they say I mean those who, who thought that the novel is positive that the novel is giving us something different that the novel is to their liking what did they say they normally re refer to what they they don't give us examples of how vibrant the novel is as they say they only uh, focus on the idea that the uh, the ideas presented are original uh, and the writer is uh, very powerful when it comes to her style right and the fact that she can pass off as a great dramatist if she focus focuses on drama perhaps right yeah the idea that yeah she is different yes different means that she's innovative and everything right but they don't they don't give us uh, examples of this power that they are referring to they don't give us examples of the originality that they are referring to okay okay so this is all happening within the house at home if we go outside the house what will we see let's look at the atmosphere outside let's look at the surroundings of the house whether we're talking about um, weathering heights or the other house remember this is more land where I mean it's it's a village kind of life where uh, I mean houses like these are surrounded by plants right by farms yes by perhaps lakes and uh, ponds and oh okay hills so how is the atmosphere outside is it calm and cozy and quiet tranquil uh, Nof is referring to the stormy weather yes the weather is for the most part stormy and stormy is negative or positive negative yes so let's let's establish the fact that there there are battles and correspondence between the atmosphere outside and the atmosphere inside the house do you agree you know that sometimes this is meant by the writer it's one of the devices or the techniques that a writer may use and it's called pathetic fallacy in in very simple terms pathetic fallacy means 
that the atmosphere outside would reflect what is happening inside with the characters. But if the characters um, are sad and everything, you, you have rains outside, for example, as if uh, nature or mother nature is crying over or uh, because of what is happening inside the house. Okay, this is called pathetic fallacy, and it's uh, it's very much uh, um, uh, operational in the novel, right? Look at how violent the characters is, and look outside. You're going to see that nature is equally violent uh, at this part of the world. So th there is battles and correspondence. If the characters are violent and everything, um, the outside, outside nature is also stormy uh, um, and the atmosphere is gloomy outside. Right? Allah Akbar Allah. Good. Uh, Nof is saying that the weather carries the emotions of the characters. Yes, more or less. Yeah, yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, Let's let's take a ten, uh, a five minute break for the prayers and then come back. How about that? Okay. So I'll see you in five minutes, inshallah. Okay. So are we all back? I guess I guess so. Right. Okay. So um, before the prayers, I was talking about the uh, we left the house. And it's going to go this way. We started off with Withering house, uh, Heights, the house. And then we're moving outside. And then we're going to go to the other house. See? Okay. Is that clear? Okay. And of course, you cannot miss the fact that we have a great deal of correspondence and battle uh, or parallelism between the two houses. It seems that this is uh, one of uh, Prontis techniques, the idea of correspondence. Okay, you have correspondence between outside the house and inside the house. You have correspondence between uh, or battles between the the different generations, okay, uh, in terms of even the names. You have battles in terms of, uh, I mean, having two houses, not only one house. Uh, it seems that by striking comparisons, there she's trying to kind of drive ideas home, like they say. She tries to... Uh, uh, communicate certain ideas and she believes that uh, establishing parallels can uh, get her there which which uh, it does I mean whenever you have sets of parallels you can always I mean the ideas um, become uh, even clearer okay so we're focusing now uh, on the outside of the home and uh, we mean outside nature so w we're talking about a village or a township where you have houses, where you have farmers or who have houses, obviously bigger than farmers, okay, because they have houses and they even have housekeepers within the house. So we're not talking about uh, poor individuals living on farms we're talking about perhaps middle class to higher middle class people okay uh, okay so outside the house would be the mountains and the hills that are typical of country life the farms that are typical of uh, uh, towns 
and villages right and uh, uh, we're also focusing on the idea that in one way or another outside nature reflects uh, what is happening inside the house in terms of the stormy relationships that we have among the different characters the tense atmosphere within the uh, family but this is reflected in the outside in terms of the storms that we are uh, um, um, you know kind of uh, that we are, are aware of that uh, the narrators refer to from uh, every time uh, and again okay So there is obviously more to the outside of the house than just the images that we we have on uh, with the uh, I mean the f the film adaptations of the novel where you normally have uh, um, Heathcliff and uh, you know um, Catherine sitting on on top of what seems to be like a, a small hill or something and gazing into nature now, this is a very romantic image of course which hides behind it a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, stuff negative stuff if you like okay there is obviously more to the novel than just this romanticized image of the two characters or the two lovers okay Uh, see uh, this is the image that they are selling to us when you look at it without uh, knowing what w without uh, if you haven't read the novel you think that it's just another love story right where uh, the associations of love stories that you're going to meet some challenges and they come to an end eventually and people get or get reconciled and they live ha happily ever after this is not happening at all in the novel that we're dealing with right remember we said that we, we started with the with, with, with weathering heights and then we came out of the house and spoke about outside nature uh, and the, the and we started to set parallels between outside nature and the house and then we're moving all the way to the other house the thrust uh, crossing grange so another house okay who who takes us there who takes when when did we get to know about the existence of this house for the first time yes uh Kamar is saying uh, catherine and heathcliff when when they were young or old Yeah, Sarah is saying when Catherine and Heathcliff were very, uh, uh, when they were kids, right? Yeah, yes. And when they went there, how did they see the house? Of course, they didn't get into the uh, inside of the house yet. Yes. okay so we're talking about perhaps more than one stage and i'm talking about um very early in the novel in their life they used to play and they used to run after each other okay so 
they didn't go to the house proper okay they run after each other and typically they go and perhaps uh, relax over there outside the house mind you they they relax outside I mean they they are not given any access to the house yet inside the inside or the interior of the house and they got impressions about the house what were their initial impressions about the house it was like what to them from the outside yeah heaven excellent it was like a paradise to them which is ironic because uh, <laughs> later much later uh, we 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 will realize that it's it's just another dysfunctional house owned by dysfunction uh, dysfunctional uh, by a disfu dysfunctional family okay uh so if when when they compared he uh, i mean i'm sorry weathering heights to the grange they believed that the grange was way better and it was like a paradise in front of their eyes why why did they feel so especially heathcliff okay yes so according to arch um, it's also it's because of the brightly lit interiors and also because of what used to happen in the other house back there how was heathcliff treated how was catherine treated were were they treated well no i'm talking i'm back there in weathering heights they were treated very badly so any place other than weathering heights for them would be heaven right are you getting the idea ironically enough this house is no different than the other you you also have uh, dysfunctional people you have uh, people who are sick mentally uh, um, by sick i mean they are very violent very brutal right uh, a, a sign of this brutality perhaps would be uh, the fact that they have dogs and in the two houses uh, those dogs beat somebody remember in weathering heights you have the dog with heathcliff's dog um, biting uh, lockwood in the other house you also have you have the dog uh, attacking uh, uh, catherine right So even the dogs, I mean the dogs are not uh, domestic dogs, uh, nice looking dogs that you would play with. They are as violent and are as brutal as their owners, right? Okay.
okay so this is in, in activity four if you look at activity four it's all about how Catherine and Heathcliff saw uh, the house at the very beginning when when they, they went there and they uh, of course were judging the the exterior of the house they didn't have access to the interior yet so judging from uh, uh, the outside of the house they said yeah this is heaven So Catherine and Heathcliff have run all the way from the top of the heights and planted themselves under the drawing room window of the Grange. Okay. And like I said, they always have this uh, uh, image of the other house, Wuthering Heights, and how they are treated there. So Heathcliff's uh, uh, accounts of, of the Grange when he first goes there with Catherine begins with the obvious contrast with the miseries of the house at Wuthering Heights, the suffering that he, he used to have, where he and Catherine spend their Sunday evenings standing, shivering in corners. See? see how grim the image is how violent it is while Hendley and his wife sit eating and drinking and singing and laughing and burning their eyes out before the fire the fire are you getting the idea so any place on earth would be uh, um, better than uh, weathering heights in their eyes. So heaven is how Heathcliff describes it. Again, and ironically enough, uh, if they get to know about what is happening within this heaven house that they dream of, they would simply say, no, uh, Weathering Heights is better and we are happy there. So as you can see, uh, this is uh, this is meant by uh, Emily Pront, the idea of barrels and the idea of correspondence, the fact that you have barrels all over the place. You have barrels in generations of people. You have barrels uh, um, in the fact that you have two houses, <laughs> two dogs crazy inhabitants in the, the in the two houses right barrels between the inside and the outside the outside outside nature uh, stormy as it is reflects the stormy relationships among and between the different characters within the houses right So the contrasts with the life at the heights are clear. Such contrasts and comparisons and parallels are fundamental to the opposing thematic and metaphorical patterns. The careful balance of locations and characters that help to structure the novel. So this is, uh, w w we're trying to say that this is meant by Emily Pront.
And we move to another part, and uh, we have already touched on that. In uh, We've been talking about the characters for quite some time. And as you may have noticed, the characters are for the mo most part mysterious. So uh, the inhabitants of the two houses are mysterious characters. So of all the mysterious characters that we have in the novel, in the two houses, Heathcliff stands out as the most outstanding. Don't you agree? Mysterious, strange, weird. Okay? So all the characters, with very few uh, exceptions, are mysterious, are weird. Weird in the way they act and react. And on top of them, on top of them would be, of course, Heathcliff. So how much do we know about Heathcliff that would contribute to this aura of mysteriousness about him? Or mystery about him? Unknown origins. Uh, um, the fact that he is different in terms of appearance, a little bit dark. Right? What else? What else do you know about Heathcliff that I don't know? Tell me. Uh, Nof is saying even when he disappeared, we didn't know how he got educated and well. Yeah, that this is this is an added mystery. You just disappear for two or three years and then come back rich and well educated. That's interesting, right? Yeah, um, the idea of revenge and uh, the fact that he insists on on uh, on wreaking revenge on everyone. Hala wants to say something. Go ahead, yeah, Hala. Hmm. Nabila, the origins of Heathcliff remain unexplained, also, and also the wealth he acquired. Excellent. Yes, good. Yeah, also the idea of unpredictability, like Kamar is saying. You can't live with somebody who's uh, extremely unpredictable. You don't know what uh, what he can do next, and this is this can be uh, potentially da dangerous. Yes, correct, right. So we have, like I said, a number of contrasts and some of them have to do with the characters and how strange the characters are across the board in the two houses. So the atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere of Wuthering Heights is less the result of a cold and bleak situation than of the strange and mysterious character of, of its inhabitants. So the inhabitants are mysterious. And this is reason enough, this is a good enough reason to have all uh, these kinds of uh, strangeness. Uh, Mayar is saying he is a dark-skinned gypsy in aspect and a gentleman in dress and man. This is what Lukwood uh, said about him. By the way, I don't want you to take. Uh, he doesn't. Uh, when he says gypsy, he doesn't mean the literal meaning of the word. 
I mean, he's trying to say that he looks like gypsies, but he is not one, okay? With all due respect to gypsies, of course. Yes. So, as we said, the characters in the two homes are strange and mysterious enough in themselves. Right? And this is the impression that Luke would got out with, or came out with, when he first went to Wuthering Heights. This is even before uh, the appearance, the apparition and the appearance of the ghost of Catherine and stuff like that, which makes it even uh, more scary for him. But beforehand, before that, he dealt with the characters and he felt that something is wrong about them. They are not normal human beings. Right? So they are strange and mysterious enough in themselves. Strangest of all is Heathcliff. This is wh who, who is saying that. We're talking about uh, Lockwood. And this is the impressions that he got. He's saying that strangeness of all is Heathcliff. His origins remain unexplained. As does the source of the wealth and education he acquires. When he temporarily disappears right so you have enough reasons to give him the label mysterious uh, his origins are unexplained we don't know where he came from his wealth his acquired newly acquired wealth is also unexplained his education the education that he received <coughs> we don't know where he went when he left for three or four years right And he is fearful. The only two people who had affection and love for him was Catherine and her father, Mr. Earnshaw. Right? Other than that, everybody else is fearful of him. Right? And Heathcliff, Heathcliff's character has been the um, the butt of a great deal of criticism and a great deal of research. People uh, and critics down through the ages uh, wanted to, uh, I mean, kind of unpack the character and and explore its motives and probe its reasons why he behaved the way he did and and everything. This is uh, this is a very uh, this is often quoted whenever people want to talk about the character of Heathcliff, an apt description would be that of Lockwood when he said, and I am quoting him. He is he is of course a reference to Heathcliff. He is a dark-skinned gyp gypsy in aspect, in dress and manners, a gentleman or a gentleman that is as much a gentleman as many a country squire. So in terms of how he dresses and how he speaks, uh, he is a gentleman, like any other uh, uh, person in, in that part of the world. This is, again, when he came back and he became uh, the owner of the house, when he had money. But prior to that, before that, he was gypsy-like. He was, uh, his appearance was not that inviting. He has an erect and handsome figure and rather morose, possibly some people might suspect him of a degree of underbred pride. This is <laughs> what we call uh, a left-handed compliment. 
you you're praising and not praising him you're saying he is a gentleman and you're saying also that he is gypsy see so the overall image is obviously that we are in in the spectacle of a strange man in appearance and in performance right in appearance and also in action he is fearful he is all inspiring and when he does stuff he does it very violently so he can be familiar in terms of dress and manners but he is very strange in terms of uh, appearance so the word gypsy like uh, appear, uh, or the phrase gypsy like appearance suggests a mysterious wealth of possible origins so dark and gypsy like he is a foreign thing okay <clears throat> so he is um what uh, what adds to his strangeness for example would would be the idea of genealogy Gene genealogy means that if i ask you uh, about uh, to give me your name and I ask you to give me your full name you may go uh, down or up until perhaps the uh, uh, I don't know how many grandfathers and you may have I mean uh, what I'm trying to say is that you don't just say Samah you say Samah Hassan Ahmed Abdul Gleel Mas'ud if I know other people I would include them if I ask you about, uh, about uh, when I say what's your name you say uh, for example uh, uh, Sara uh, uh, Muhammad Ahmed Al Hariri Fuad Ali and you never stop until I ask you to stop this is called genealogy and people are proud of that right the history of the family is of families is very important but in, in, in Heathcliff's case, we only know Heathcliff, right? He doesn't have a second name. He doesn't have a family name, which is obviously very unfamiliar, which is strange in a house and in a place where genealogy and family history means a lot. This would add to the strangeness of the whole thing, right? So look at all the characters. They have fathers and they have family names. Yes. Uh, he even started a family right but it doesn't seem that uh, he could compensate for the loss of family history that he that has been dogging him all through okay so he is uh, unfamiliar and strange in everything except for the fact that we have people like him in literature in this case he's not uh, as a literary figure he's not strange because we have people like him who are as mysterious you see see the irony or the contrast so in the novel okay within the family 
he has no origins he is quite unfamiliar but in literature in general he is very familiar because we have seen and we have read about so many people like him especially with the romantics the romantics have characters like Heathcliff who are very strange weird if you're familiar with the romantics um, I think you did them uh, perhaps last semester uh, Wordsworth and Shelley and they normally have or feature characters like that are like Heathcliff they glorify characters like he I mean they have uh, there is a, f a famous romantic poet by the name of Byron and uh, Lord Byron's characters in his uh, poetic dramas and in her poetry in general in his uh, his poetry in general they are all like this very strange taken from other uh, from other cultures like Manfred Manfred is a poetic drama and it is o it is all about um, a very strange uh, character uh, who is Manfred who is also very defiant, very challenging, uh, who, uh, somebody who goes against social and political and even religious norms. We also have the Corsair. The Corsair is another character in one of Lord Byron's poems, long poems. And he is exactly like uh, uh, Heathcliff. Um, I think we have, you know, lines of poetry that can show you the affinity uh, and how close Heathcliff is to, to the characters that we're talking about. So the 1848 reviewer of Wuthering Heights for the examiner compared Heathcliff with the hero of the Corsair by the romantic poet Lord Byron. So, the Corsair is, uh, as you can see, is a poetic work by Lord Byron. So, the hero of the Corsair happens to be very similar to uh, Heathcliff. So, like the Corsair and other such melodramatic heroes, he, he is a reference to uh, Heathcliff, is linked to one virtue and a thousand crimes. So, Characters like these, they can have one virtue, they can have one good point, but they can have a thousand bad or negative points. So Heathcliff shares the foreignness that is highlighted in the Corsair. And this is, uh, for example, taken from the poem. When you read it, you uh, you automatically identify this character with Heathcliff. His features, deepening lines and varying hue, at times attracted yet perplexed the view, as if within that murkiness of mind, worked feelings fearful and yet undefined. There was a laughing devil in his sneer that raised emotions both of rage and fear, and where his frown of hatred darkly fell, hope weathering fled and mercy sighed farewell. As you can see, the description fits uh, um, Heathcliff right away. He knew himself a villain, but he deemed the rest no better than the thing he seemed. He knew himself detested, but he knew the horse that lured him uh, crouched and dreaded to lone, wild and strange. He stood alike exempt from all affection and from all contempt. You see, look at them. I would like you when you finish from here, I would like you to go back and revisit the Corsair by and it's readily available on online. Read the poem, and I'm sure you, you're going to find, you, you can establish links and parallels between Heathcliff and uh, the hero of uh, this work. 
uh, we have another character in another uh, poetic drama also by Lord Byron it's called Manfred so Heathcliff might also be compared to the protagonist the hero of Byron's first drama Manfred who dark proud tormented by secret sin and the death of his sister Astarte defines uh, defies accepted religious forms of redemption even at the point of death see it's the same thing uh, they even compare the character of Heathcliff to the characters uh, of gothic novels and gothic novels are novels that are all about mystery and violence big uh, castles and those castles look very strange uh, when you when you finish from here I would like you to look the phrase gothic novel up look at what gothic gothic I mean go to images in Google and write gothic and see what will come out you'll have very strange uh, uh, houses I, I think you did that in AA 100A right if I'm not mistaken I did I did a course on that when you spoke about architecture yeah this was a a 100 a not B I remember where you have gothic architecture where you have very strange uh, uh, palaces right look go revisit this part in in the book if you happen to uh, to have it or simply google the the word gothic Google the word gothic novels. Uh, yes, yes, th that's correct. Uh, there is also another novel, and like I said, this is gothic, and it's uh, written by Ra Radcliffe. Ra Ra Radcliffe happens to be uh, uh, one of the pioneers of gothic novels, and and the characters that she is presenting. In the novel, it's called the Castles of Athlin and Dun Bain. Uh, um, all the description applies to Catherine uh, to um, Heathcliff. Mm -hmm. uh, the character that we're talking about is Malcolm. Uh, he is bent on revenge, physically courageous, and possessed of a wild and terrific countenance. A character in whom potential virtue has been replaced by viciousness of action. Like Heathcliff, he has usurped the property rights of the hereditary owners of his house. And the list goes on and on and on. Uh, again, um, the line the line that we're pursuing is not simply the mysteriousness or the mystery of the character of Heathcliff and full stop. All the other characters are mysterious in their own rights. Remember, they are as mysterious, if you like. Uh, and it's very strange that even the women characters in the novel are as mysterious, uh, which is very strange. If you compare, for example, the uh, women characters in a gothic novel, you see them very submissive. Uh, um, they play the vic They are normally the victims of their male counterparts. But this is not obviously happening in Wuthering Heights. Yeah, uh, Catherine is very, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, pretty much everyone is mysterious. So, 
So the heroines of Gothic novels are demure, accomplished, passive, and so exceptionally modest as never to betray their passions, except by downcast looks, blushes, and the occasional overheard lyric as they console themselves. Nothing could be further from the behavior of the young women in Wuthering Heights. See? Okay. Do you have any questions? Are you tired? Should should we uh, kind of continue for uh, 15 more minutes, perhaps? Okay, good, good, nice. So we're now looking at the structure of the novel. So how is structure made possible in a novel? Where do you look for structure in a novel? You look at the narrative. Narrative, um, I mean the point of view and how it is carried across um, through the narrator. Uh, who is the narrator and what kind of narrator he is uh, or she is for that matter first person narrator or third person and why do we have only one single narrator or a number of narrators if there are uh, parallels but this is also a device and a technique right Okay, so strange as it is, strange as it is, the novel adds to its strangeness by experimenting with familiar literary classifications. You don't have those familiar literary classifications anymore. They are twisted so that they can serve the artistic purposes of Emily Pronte. Okay. So we're talking about the uh, also we're trying to strike uh, a kind of parallel between the structure and the idea of home. You you know what home is if you talk about the physical, uh, uh, you know, uh, dimensions of a place. A, a, a novel can be also compared to a home. In a home, you, ha you normally have uh, rooms. In a novel, you also have chapters. Uh, they are uh, more or less like uh, rooms. And the one who came up with this analogy uh, is, uh, who is that? Henry, yeah, Henry James. He spoke about this house of fiction kind of thing. This is the analogy that he came out with, house of fiction. So a novel is pretty much like a house that has rooms in it. Okay, so let's look at the narrative and let's look at the narrative progression and whether it's smooth uh, and flowing or otherwise. Obviously, it's not. Uh, we don't we don't start in the past. Actually, we start with uh, Lockwood talking about the present moment, and then after a while, he's going to 
stop narrating and Nelly Dean is going to take over and she's going to take us all the way back like 20 years back in time right again we spoke about the idea of contrasts and repetitions and correspondence and battles and we said uh, these are perhaps devices that uh, Emily Pronti uh, is using so that she can uh, kind of get her ideas across to us. So there is a constant symmetrical patterning of contrast and repetition between characters. Characters are related not just through naming and genealogy, but through their similar yet different experience. Almost the same experience, different generations, same experience. Abuse, violence, um, same, same names with different generations, right? Two houses, but the events are pretty much the same in terms of violence and verbal and domestic abuse, right? So this is all. Uh, this all contribute to a sense of a tightly organized literary structure. Nevertheless, the relentless patterns of repetition with variation are also disconcerting. You can say that they establish uh, coherence. Um, on uh, perhaps, no, it doesn't happen. It can be. They can be confusing. <coughs> So, the narrators and the narrative frames that we have. Uh, by now, you know who the narrators are, right? You have Nelly Dean, you have Lookwood, you have Catherine through her diary. Who else? Isabella. See? And this is all about this part is all about Lookwood and how he narrates, and whether you can rely on his narrative. Uh, remember, I keep telling you that you have to take whatever Lookwood uh, says with a grain of salt. He's not an objective narrator for uh, because he, uh, like we said, uh, he got disappointed at the very beginning. He had high hopes when he went to the house and he was treated the way he uh, he was treated. He felt shocked, and this shock is going to follow him till the end of the novel. He's not neutral anymore. Uh, his judgments and assessments of what is happening uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, or are uh, clouded uh, and colored by his prejudice and bias against the family, given what happened to him at the beginning. On the other hand, you also need to take your guard up against the narration and the recounting of Nelly Dean. Uh, Nelly, uh, what's her name? Nelly White. Nelly Dean, I think, yes. The other uh, principal or main, main narrator. Because she is more or less family. She has been with them for quite some time. And she has her affinities and sympathies with them or for them. Okay? So when she narrates stories, she makes sure that she doesn't go heavy on the characters bad and violent as they are in other words she 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 comes up with excuses and explanations and justifications she, uh, again she's not a neutral a neutral uh, neutral uh, narrator um 
I guess we'll uh, have to stop on this note and with this item uh, we still have uh, this week we have a meeting another meeting on Thursday right um, okay so we're we're finishing the weathering heights chapters inshallah on Thursday if you have any questions before I leave go ahead you guys have two minutes okay okay uh, then if you don't have any questions I'll um, I'll call it a night and uh, you'll have a good night